Hi, how's it going? I'm Marlena. Thanks for wandering by. Welcome or welcome back to Deck and Walk 2023. And that's the hashtag that's sticking with this um, practice of mine, even though we are fully into 2024. For those of you that um, may not know what a Deccan is or a Deccan walk is, I encourage you to go ahead and visit my description box down below where I have a playlist of all the videos that I've made for this particular practice for a, almost an entire year now. I'm really excited and, and really um, just, I can't believe that I did it, that I'm done this and I'm almost done with 36 videos every 10 days across <laughs> an entire year. So in any case, that kind of gives you an idea of what a deck and walk is. We've been following the zo um, zodiacal wheel of the year. Each zodiac sign is split into three pieces or decans that make up 10 days or 10 degrees of the sky and <clears throat> according to Western astrology. And they're associated with a minor card in the tarot the, um, from two to 10 one of the minor cards that run from two to 10. And then um, they also have associations based on the planet and the sign um, with a major card in the tarot. So we've been looking at the major cards and um, that come together, you know, in the minor card of the Deccan. So, I mean, I basically just explain what it is to you. Anyway, visit the description box below for that playlist as well as all of the resources that I've been using throughout this journey. There's the books, the decks, the, I mean, and not just what I'm showing in this video, just like across the entire journey. And there's also free resources, websites, and um, just all different kinds of stuff that you guys can, can use along your own deck and walk journey. And I just want to point out to you that you can start a deck and walk any time you want. You do not have to begin at the you know start of a new calendar year. You do not have to begin at the start of the zodiac cycle, which begins in March with Aries. You you don't have to do it that way. That I did it that way. I started um because that's where the my book started <laughs> in March. But you can start a deck and walk any time you like. Okay, so now without all any more ado, let's get into the current Deccan. Welcome to <laughs> the third Deccan of Aquarius. So we are now in Aquarius 3 and I think, I think this video might be going up a little late. Um, according to, I think I was off, I don't know, but in any case, Aquarius 3. <laughs> this card comes from the Divine Deck and Tarot, which was sent to me by Reese Marin and I've used throughout this entire journey. A, a fantastic resource for me, really helpful throughout this entire deck and walk. So here we are in the third decan of, of Aquarius, which is the Seven of Swords. Well, let's talk about this up here first though, like we always do. So it's um, moon in Aquarius and it is fixed air. So that means that Aquarius is a fixed air sign. It comes smack in the middle of its season. So it's stable. It's not moving. <laughs> and it's um, in the middle of the winter season uh, here in the northern hemisphere. And then we have um, the dates, February 9th through February 18th. And these can be off by a day or two. So I might still be good. <laughs> I've usually been going by these particular um, dates. Anyway, and then we have our Seven of Swords. And we have our Hermetic title on the card, which is the Lord of Unstable Effort. And as we see in the Crowley card on the Thoth Tarot, the key word is futility, Lord of Unstable Effort or futility. All right, and so we always start with taking a look at the two uh, major cards that are that are associated. So we have, um, the, the, these are cards from the Star Codes Astro Oracle, 
and we talked about Aquarius, the last two decans, um, the water bearer, and the key word is collaborate. So Aquarius is associated with the star card. One of my favorite cards. I love the star. Who doesn't love the star? Well, I mean, I guess there might be people who don't. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. And then this is the star card from the Thoth Tarot. Last decan, or the last couple decans, I think I didn't spend much time talking about Thoth. And this time, I think I'm going to spend more time talking about the Thoth card. In any case, here's the star. This The star in the Thoth is like stunningly beautiful. Like it's breathtakingly beautiful. I, yeah, I don't even know. Like it just, it takes my breath away. Just like I said, it's one of the most beautiful, uh, paintings I have ever seen. I love it so much. So then we have, now we have moon. Now you'll remember it's, it's tricky. <laughs> it's tricky. That's funny that the moon is tricky. Look, and I am, um, I have my, I don't know if you guys can see, or you guys can't see unless I like tip my, it's my coffee mug says shoot for the moon. <laughs> anyway, all that to tell you that the moon is a, is not lined up. The planetary influence of the moon is not lined up with the moon card, right? And But rather the high priestess, which we've seen before because we visited lots of moon-ruled Deccan cards before. So here she is, the high priestess, another one of my favorite, favorite cards. And here's our high priestess. Uh, the priestess from um, the Thoth Tarot. And here we have the moon from the Star Codes Astro Oracle with the keyword perception. So often um, what I like to do in my Deccan studies is think about the influence of these two major cards into the, um, into the minor card to get a sense of how, you know, how the Golden Dawn um, came about the meanings and how these illustrations, you know, for the meanings came about. Now, the Seven of Swords is a, a controversial card, a difficult card. I mean, I feel like throughout my journey learning tarot, it's one of the cards that I think folks have the most difficulty um, reconciling. Um, the one that maybe some folks just immediately, you know, think of it as this like sneaky, sneaky, and then they leave it at that. Other folks feel like there's more to it. Um, but it's one of those that I think gets questioned a lot, or I've seen lots of folks question like my, you know, my more veteran tarot reader friends, um, when they're, give, you know, when they are answering questions about the tarot, um, often I hear folks ask about what the, what does the Seven of Swords mean? And they get, you know, this like confusion between the five and the seven. So the Seven of Swords for me is, it's tricky um, because I do have this like understanding of it um, that ac across the scope of the the Waite Smith and the um, and the Thoth, this was when I first started learning the Thoth Tarot. This was the first card I ever pulled in a daily draw, and the word futility flashed up in my face, and I was just like. I was just like, I, for when I studied Thoth, I did a year long daily draw of the Thoth a couple years ago. And for my first card to pop up as futility, it was just insane to me. It was crazy. So when I learned more about, you know, what this card means and, you know, put together my own feelings about it, the ideas kind of merged. So I don't often think of that like sneaky sneak. Rather, I, d I think of this card most certainly as being um, something that happens in the mind and a lot of like self-sabotage and, you know, um, th there are different things that, you know, self-sabotage and negative self-talk um, and 
the way that Susan Chang talks about it in 36 Secrets is a divided mind. So I did go to the books this time. Let me start real quick with Corinne Kenner before I get into Chang. So I did highlight a, um, just a small portion of what Corinne Kenner had to say because I was um, looking into like the Golden Dawn um, for me, like the, the the bigger picture, not just Waite Smith, not just Thoth, but like both of these Golden Dawn cards. So the Golden Dawn designers of this card called Moon and Aquarius, the Lord of Unstable Effort, because it illustrates the shifting world of shadows and gloom. The card could portray the death of a dream or the difficult process of establishing a new reality. So it's, um, I mean, it's interesting because yes, for me, this is something that's happening in the, in the landscape of the mind, but the way that, you know, Corinne uh, Kenner is describing this, the shifting world of shadows and gloom. Like if you think about this as the realm of the high priestess and the star, we're the moon and the stars. <laughs> you know, we are definitely in this, you know, in the celestial air, arena, right? So we are in, um, we are in the dark hidden places. You know, we are in the, we're looking at the high priestess, right? And Susan Chang talks about her as well. We're talking about like the keeper of the secrets, the shadows, the, um, well, illusions runs more with that um, concept of the moon, right? Perception, you know, um, the way that we look at things and the moon tr may trick us, right? That's one of the, that's one of the things about the moon card itself too, but like, all of those things, you know, run together. So Susan Chang, 36 Secrets, that's been our main book um, that most of us that have been following along with, you know, most of you that have been following along with me have been using. So I highlighted some, you know, some things from Susan Chang's um, chapter on it. I like that she calls this the card of the divided mind. That, that I think was really cool. The it feels tied to this hermetic um, title, right? You know, the Lord of Unstable Effort, Futility, the card of the divided mind. Um, and so she says, I like to call the Seven of Swords the card of the div divided mind. Have you ever said to yourself, I'm of two minds about that? Of course you have. We're complicated people and we can hold two contradictory thoughts in our heads at the same time. The twisted posture of our conniving friend. <laughs> she talks a lot about, you know, this. Um, so, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting myself mid quote. But she talks a lot about the imagery on the Wait Smith card. So, if you haven't read Susan Chang's chapter, you definitely should. Um, but you know, it's pretty apparent. Uh, that this looks like that this is a person who has stolen these swords and is looking back um, on this encampment, right? Um, she talks a lot about how this is a stage card. So it's, you can see it as, you know, cause it has that, the stage uh, like kind of up front. Um, so you can see it that way as more like a performance type of card. Anyway, she says, <laughs> our conniving friend, the head is going one way, the feet going another. So this conveys the doubleness of intention. I had I had not really thought of that before, that the feet are going one way. I mean, like we assume that the looking back is about, you know, for safety's sake, so you don't get caught. <laughs> but when you think of like, for me, I think of these behaviors as not literal behaviors, but what our mind is doing. <laughs> That's what I think of it as. Like our mind is deceiving us. Our mind is, you know, going, is, is conflicted. Our mind is playing tricks on us. Our mind is, you know, telling us one thing 
that's, you know, it's, it's not the truth. It's negative self-talk. So like, it's just, it's, that's what I think of it, that this is happening in the mind. And then there's this hidden truth there. Um, and there's this hope there as well. I don't know. I don't know. I still, you know, I'm still putting, putting it together. So, um, Susan Chang also talks about how this is, um, that there are themes of separation in the Aquarius cards. The five, six, and seven of swords are the Aquarius cards. And, you know, she, we talked about the myth of Ganymede. She told you about the myth of Ganymede. If you read, you know, her book, um, we talked, she talked about Inanna, um, Inanna's descent. And I talked about that too in the five of swords, um, with Inanna and, um, her sister, um, that myth. And so visit that video if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and so, and Persephone, um, she brought up Persephone. So like all of these are stories of separation, Inanna's descent, Ganymede's, you know, abduction and being taken up to the gods and Persephone who, um, you know, separated from her mother Demeter for um, three months out of the year. Um, but so what she said is that perhaps the ultimate story of separation um, is the Seven of Swords is Odysseus um, and the Odyssey. And I just was like, I was so excited to read that. I mean, people bring up the Odyssey all the time. Like the Odyssey is, you know, I mean, it's one of the most famous ancient epics of all time. But I'm currently reading the Odyssey, rereading the Odyssey. I mean, I read the Odyssey, probably not cover to cover, uh, in college. And I recently listened to a retelling of the Odyssey, but now I'm also reading the, um, Emily Wilson translation of the Odyssey. And I love Odysseus. I love the Odyssey. And she, you know, the way the, that, that she talks about, um, Odysseus as the Seven of Swords, I don't think in any of the Greek mythology decks that I've been working with, it put him here. I don't think. I'd have to take a look. But that's, it's really, it's just, I find it interesting because Odysseus is always described as wily, cunning Odysseus. Wily, cunning Odysseus, you know, who through lots of different deceptions, um, gets through, you know, different obstacles. And Susan Chang mentioned some of them, um, that in, in the Odyssey, which ones does she bring up? Cause there's so many, um, what does she say? Um, oh, but before she said, before I tell you those examples from the Odyssey, she's talking about how... This, the Seven of Swords, oh, the Seven of Swords can be all these different people. Any role where one's apparent direction and one's true intentions are not in line with each other. So like some sort of deception. Um, let's see, innumerable were Odysseus's acts of deception. Um, the Trojan horse, his sheep assisted escape from the murderous Cyclops, Polyphemus, and his besting of the suitors in disguise, you know, at the end of the Odyssey. Um, so she says, like the furtive klepto in the Seven of Swords, this was a man who viewed every obstacle as a problem that could be solved to his advantage. Often his boldness ended in tragedy, but he survived. And that, of course, was the point. So I thought that was pretty cool um, that she brought in um, the Odyssey and Odysseus. And I had never considered that wily, cunning Odysseus um, here in the Seven of Swords. And then, it, you know, looking at the broader um, three cards of Aquarius as like this... Um, separation, uh, you know, and then all of that happening in the mind, which really in the mind is for me what, what the Thoth card is about. So let's, let's talk about probably my favorite book that I've been working in through this entire journey, the Tarot Handbook by Angelus Arian. And we'll, we'll just focus a little bit on the Thoth piece. 
card for the Seven of Swords, Futility, has um, a sword in the middle that is, if you look at it, it looks like it's being attacked <laughs> by these other smaller swords. And it's broken um, in those places or it has marks in those places. We have the planetary glyphs around it with our moon at the top. There is a glyph of the sun here down below and our, I don't know if you guys can see, I'm trying to make it so you can see. So the sun down below and the Aquarius sign down here. I should grab my large thoth. Maybe I'll go do that. Okay, I grabbed my Seven of Swords from the my Thoth Greeny, um, which I haven't actually worked with in a while. I've been, when I go, when I work with my Thoth, I work with the trimmed Thoth that I have, and I've neglected my Greeny um, for a little while. We have our um, moon, and then we have a sun down here and the Aquarius uh, sign. So both, um, well, I said I was gonna talk about Angel's Arian first, but let me talk about um, Gerd Ziegler. So Gerd Ziegler, Mirror of the Soul. This is a fabulous, um, a fabulous book to just really kind of dig into the astrology. I didn't really realize that when I was first learning Thoth, that Gerd Ziegler really gets into the 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 energy of the astrology and it really makes sense once you learn the astrological parts of things so the way that Gerd Ziegler talks about the lord of unstable effort futility here in the seven of swords is um that your and, and angels arian does a similar thing where this is the um, the sun and the moon represent the conscious and subconscious, so subconscious and conscious. <laughs> I would have put the conscious up and the subconscious down personally. And then these are the um, the doubts, like the negative self-talk and what you tell yourself when you want something but can't have it. Or is that what Angelus Arian said? Oh my goodness, I'm mixing up the two. But it's it's a very similar idea, right? Gloomy subconscious expectations muddy your insight. This is from Gerd Ziegler. A heavy anxiety prevails, although rea in reality, everything is going perfectly well. So it's like a card of negative self-talk and sabotage. It's all in perception. So I brought out, <laughs> I brought out the, um, the other planet cards. So let me move this. Let me move this, uh, these guys out of the way too. So we have our seven of swords and then we have the moon and we have the sun and both Gerd Ziegler and, sorry, I'm just like trying to put the book down so I can, we have Gerd Ziegler and Angelus Arian who talk about the planetary glyphs on the handles as those like things that you tell yourself, right? Those negative things that you tell yourself. So we have the sun source, the moon perception, um, and then we have Mars. So here's Mars. We have Venus. We have, well, so there's two thoughts about this particular glyph here. Let me bring it up to you guys so you can see it. So uh, they're divided. So Angel's Arian says that this represents again, the sun and the moon. And Ziegler brings in Neptune here, which isn't one of the seven classical planets. And I, you know, um, I haven't done a whole lot of work with Neptune at all, but I'll put Neptune here as well, Neptune. Um, and then we have over on this side, we have Jupiter. And um, Mercury, I love Mercury because Mercury is the ruling planet of my zodiac sign. So I love Mercury and I am a big a Hermes fan. And then we have um, Saturn. Actually, maybe I'll take Neptune out because I want my seven, <laughs> I want my, my seven. Okay, 
I guess I'll just, you know, Neptune was there. You saw it. <laughs> I'm on my seven here on screen. So let me just go quickly through what, um, what the negative self-talk that um, Gerd Ziegler says comes from each of these planets. And then I'll also share what Angelus Arian says about them too. Gerd Ziegler uses Neptune and says, everything seems to be clouded by a film or a veil. I just don't know what I really want. Venus, the energy of Venus um, here as like a stabbing force is, but it's too good to be true. Mars, um, I haven't the energy, there's no time, I'm already too old, <laughs> which is interesting. And then Jupiter would say, um, that's too much good at once. I could never cope with so much success. So this is like, sabotaging your own success, fear of success. Sounds like the 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 premise that Ziegler is working from is that things are good and we are doubting. It's these are the doubts and self-sabotage that you know, negative self-talk. Mercury um Mercury's voice here is but I just can't convey it properly. And then Saturn is, it's simply too much trouble and it takes too long. So these literally destructive thoughts need not be taken seriously. The reality is somewhat different from your present perception of it. Perception, moon, in Aquarius. So interesting. Now, I think I like what Angela's Arian has to say more, but I know I've worked with the Gerd Ziegler book specifically, um, you know, with this card as well. So let's see what Angela's Arian her oh. handbook, Angela's Arian. All right. The seven of swords is that state of mind which produces futility or the sense of helplessness, hopelessness, or what's the use. Basically, this state of mind is knowing mentally what you want, which is represented by the central sword and then telling yourself all the reasons why it's not going to work, which is represented by the six swords coming in at the central sword. She's so awesome. Like Angel's Arian, like going through, working with the tarot as a tool for personal self growth, you can't, you can't not read this book. Like I'm just saying, don't sleep on it. If it's something that you've thought of getting, it's, I know it's this giant, it's this giant unwieldy book and I know it's thoth and, um, and I know that a lot uh, more people read Wade Smith than they do Thoth, I think. I don't know what, how I'm coming up with that stat. But anyway, what I'm saying is, is even if you're not a Thoth reader, this book is, you, you got to read it. <laughs> um, anyway, so it's, and, and you know what's funny is that Angelus Arian calls this the sun and moon in Aquarius as the astrology not just the moon, which I find incredibly interesting. Um, and the way that she talks about it is the conscious and the subconscious, just like how Gerd Ziegler did. Like this is something that's going on in your mind. Like the conscious thing is what you are going after or what you want. And then the subconscious are all these crazy, not crazy, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. All these like, self-doubt thoughts that come through. So here's how she um, interprets them. Let's see. Da, da, da. All right, here we go. So it's six ways that we sabotage what we want are revealed by the astrological symbols on the handles of the swords. The negative aspect of Saturn or the yes but aspect of Saturn is telling ourselves that there's too much red tape or too many details. The other handle of the sword has the symbol of Mercury. Okay, here's the, sim the negative self-talk of Mercury. All negative communication to the self about why this project or situation won't work. The negative self-talk of Jupiter is that I'm not lucky, it's too constricted, too limiting. On the handle with Mars, the um, 
the positive aspect of Mars is energy, vitality, assertion. The negative of Mars would be, I don't have enough energy. I'm exhausted, burnt out, dull, boring. And then the negative self talk of Venus is, I don't really care. It doesn't mean anything to me anyway, is the sabotaging component of Venus. Like, I absolutely love the way that she does that because it, it does, it, it absolutely sounds like, like very real components of what we do in our minds. Um, to self-sabotage or doubt ourselves when there's something that we really want. And it's really funny because I've been, <laughs> I've been doubting myself about a particular project recently. And this is so illuminating. <laughs> it's so funny because it's the moon in Aquarius and it's illuminating. I just, it's making so much sense to me why right now th these are the thoughts that I'm having um, across these different energies from the planets. And I just, yeah, it's, it's kind of, kind of amazing. And I honestly, you know, see the seven of swords um, in this way that, um, that self doubt, that unstable effort, that futility that goes on in the mind when you have the, you know, these two energies coming together, this like keeper of secrets and shadows, um, and this, you know, water bearer, right? Who is, in this, in the stars, you know, like this is the direction, this is the hope, the future, the, the star, right? You know, that's guiding and leading us. And like, you know, I didn't read to you what Susan Chang said about the high priestess, but you know, the high priestess as that, um, keeper of secrets, but like, that's really interesting. Like this is lighting the way and this is in some senses lighting the way too, but like you can see how it gets murky maybe with these two together in the mind. And yeah, and there's, you know, and then it, bringing in that piece of like of Odysseus <laughs> also really, I, I thought was really, really cool. But in terms of like how I work with the Seven of Swords in my practice, I think I've aligned very much with this um, Thoth card, with the Futility card, because man, it was the first card I got. This is the first Thoth card that I really spent time with. And it opened up a world of, um, apparently of astrology that I didn't, um, I didn't know then that I was going to really, you know, dive into. Okay, that's it. I hope, I hope, I always laugh at myself at this point in the video. I hope that I have made sense and um, for you guys about the Seven of Swords, this very wily card, this sneaky sneak, this um, cunning guy with a furry, fuzzy, funny hat. <laughs> um, in any case, I hope that I have um, you know, giving you some things, some food for thought, some things to think about with this particular card and its, um, astrological associations. As always, I will leave a link, um, to a PDF of the spread that I have created for this particular Deccan, um, in the description box down below. So check that out. Um, thank you so much, all of you that, again, that have been with me in this journey from the beginning. To those of you that have joined me w at whatever point along the way, and to anybody that's watching now and in future times when I've long been done with this particular practice, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Um, and yeah, that's it. I. I hope that you all have a beautiful, wonderful third decan of Aquarius. Uh, we are, this is it. The, the next zodiac sign is the last sign of the zodiac um, before it returns to Aries. So Pisces is next. 
and then that's it for my for my particular deck and walk um we'll end with pisces so like it's like the home stretch <laughs> we're the home stretch anyway thanks again for being here thanks for sticking with me i hope that you all have a beautiful wonderful uh third decan of aries and a beautiful wonderful day bye